Okay, so we're going to we're looking at some abstract properties of finite fields. I think the last uh, class I was talking about some kind of isomorphism and all that. So so let's uh, let's spend some time uh, with that and see if we can uh, clarify. I mean, I want to clarify some of those notions. So 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 let's see a few examples. Okay, the first one uh, I want to talk about is at four. Remember the form in which we constructed at four so far looks like this, right? So alpha square is one plus alpha, and then what? Alpha bar three would be one, right? Okay, so this is the form in which we've been constructing uh, f four, right? Polynomials and modulo x squared plus x plus one. Okay, so someone may come along and say he has another field, okay, some other field. Okay. It's exactly four elements, right? And maybe he calls it A, B, C, and D. Okay, right? And then he might say all these things. He might say so. So, so here, <coughs> excuse me. So here you can define between zero, one, one, and alpha squared the plus operation. What's the plus operation? Right, so this is how the plus operation gets defined. Right, so that's how you define the plus operation. You also have the time separation, right? So you define it. So this is how you, this is how the time separation works in in F4 that we defined. Okay. So someone might come along and say he has some other field A B C D, and then he will define. So now in a field A, you define the plus and the times operation, right? So so you might define plus and the times like this. Okay. So you might say plus. And they might put A right there. And then B here, and then C D here, right? C here, okay? And then you may define the dot times operation also. Okay? You might do this. A, 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 C, D, C, C. D. And then you might say this is D and this is B. Okay, so someone might come along and say I have another field, and this is the plus and this is the times, and you can check all the field axioms with these operations. You can check, for instance, the additive identity would be A, the multiplicative identity will be B. Every element will have an additive inverse. Every element will have a multiplicative inverse. You can check all those things. Okay, so you can do that. And you'll see that this is a valid field, right? But then you have to think about whether these two fields are really different, okay? Except for the fact that I've called zero as a, one as b, alpha as c, and alpha square as d. There is really no difference. See, if you if you do c squared here in this field, what do you get? C times c is d. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing. It's also true that d equals b plus c. Okay, so all those things are true. So so in a way, these two fields are not really different. They are they are the same in some other terms. Okay. So to how do how do you write that very formally is the following thing, and that's why these ideas of isomorphism will enter the picture. Okay. So you can have an isomorphism between between G and F4. Okay. So what is an isomorphism? It's just a one-to-one and onto map. Between two sets that are equal in size, okay, so it's a one-to-one -one map which respects the plus and the dot. Okay, it should respect, it should be consistent with the addition and 
uh, multiplication. So let me define this function here. So in G I have A, B, C, D and let's say this function F maps A to 0, B to 1, C to alpha and B to alpha squared. Okay, so this is my one to one map of the invertible and this function F has to respect uh, addition and multiplication. What do I mean by that? If you have alpha beta and G and alpha plus beta right should should map so f of alpha plus beta should be f of alpha plus f of beta then f of alpha times beta should be f of alpha times f of beta for all alpha beta and g okay so this should happen so this is what i mean by saying a one to one map from g to f4 or let's say uh, what, what is this map called a uh, proper map from g into F4 which respects the addition and multiplication creates some kind of a homomorphism or in this case it is an isomorphism because both of them are the same okay which respects the addition and the multiplication okay so if you do if you do addition first in G and then invoke F it is the same as invoking F first and then doing the addition in F4 okay remember this, this plus is in F4 right what about this plus it is in G okay so it is a different kind of object. So such things are isomorphic and, and clearly they, they don't add to your uh, set of possible fields. So nobody can say that G is not only a new field. Okay? The thing you do in G, you can also do in F4. So it's not anything new. Okay? So fundamentally it's not new. Okay? So that is something to something to remember when you when you think of uh, oh my goodness. When you think of this isomorphism idea. Okay? So now what we did in the last class was something a little bit more refined than this, a little bit more uh, more abstract maybe. Okay, so let me describe what we did, what we did in last class maybe with a picture. Okay, so we we first started with the field of okay, some finite field. Okay, and let's say there was an element beta and f. Okay, right. So from here, from this beta, we constructed this m beta x. Okay, interestingly, we see that m beta of x has beta as a root. Okay, remember this is this is a set P. Okay, so this is characteristic P. Okay, this is in set P x. It has beta as a root and it is also irreducible. Okay, so what we can do with this guy is we can use it to construct a field. Construct the field G, okay, using power of x equals m beta of x. We can do this, right? So, so, so this this picture is a nice picture to keep in mind. Okay, so so if you have a field f of characteristic p, and then you have some element beta and f, you go to its minimal polynomial. You know it's a polynomial in ZPX. You know it is irreducible. Okay, right? Once you know, once you have an irreducible polynomial in ZPX, you can always use it as your pi of x in the field construction and come up with a field. Okay, what is this field? This field is a set of all polynomials in some alpha. Okay, and what does that alpha do? Right? So the coefficients are from ZP, right? For the polynomials. Addition is modulo p, like in ZP, and for multiplication you have to use pi of alpha equal to 0. Okay, so that is the rules for constructing this field. Okay, so please remember that. Now what one can show is there is a homomorphism from here to here. Okay, from this field you can take every element of this field and map it to some element of this field F. Okay, in such a way that addition and multiplication are present. Okay, you can do that. Okay, so if you take two elements here and add them here and then invoke this homomorphism, you will go to some element. That will be the same element that you would get if you first invoke it f on each of these things and then do the addition in. Okay, and that comes very easily. I mean, it's not so hard to come up with that. In fact, that field here is basically the field that is generated by beta. Right? You think about it. You take beta here and then look at all the polynomials in beta with coefficients from Zp. Okay, that that is clearly inside F, right? So what is what is that part which is isomorphic to this guy here? So that guy is you look at all 
a naught plus a one beta plus seven two a m so a d minus a d minus one beta to d minus one. What is d? D is the degree of this guy, right? So if you look at this set for all o i n z p, right? This is the set which completely is contained in F, right? There's no problem. And every element of this set is isomorphic to. I mean, this not every element. This, this set actually is isomorphic to G. Okay, so there's an isomorphism here. Right? What do you get by isomorphism? The alpha that you used in constructing this field, you map it to the beta that you had. Okay, and then every element will there will map to every element here. And you know this is inside that field F, and that base in G. <coughs> so clearly there's an isomorphism. Okay. So this this is the idea which kind of connects fields. And polynomials in a very very tight way, okay. And the connection is also quite much tighter because you know that x bar p bar m minus x factors in into linear factors in a field of size p bar m, okay. So every element will have a irreducible factor of well, have a minimal polynomial which is an irreducible factor of x bar p bar m minus x, okay. So there's a very nice connection among these polynomials with x bar p bar m minus x. And then there's also this field which you can construct if, and then that is inside this. Okay. At this point, this S, S is a general finite field. Somebody tells me that there's a finite field with the param elements, and I can nail it down like this. Okay. So I know it has an isomorphic field like this. Okay. So every every finite field has that. All right. So that's the that's the idea here. So let me depict this with one explicit example, and then maybe that you'll see what I mean. Okay. So the example we're going to take. We got 16 because that's where the most uh, the non-trivial example comes. So let's say we do uh, 16 in the following way. Okay, I'll take alpha plus four is equal to alpha. Remember, 16 means characteristic is two. Two is equal to zero. Okay, so it's all modulo two minus is the same as plus. And you have alpha plus four is one plus alpha. Alpha is a primitive element. Okay, so I'm going to say alpha is a primitive element. So alpha plus 16 is one. Okay. So, so let's try and construct a few of these things. So, so, you, so the elements of this field will be zero, one, alpha, alpha square, alpha plus three. Okay, then alpha plus four will be one plus alpha. What about alpha plus five? Alpha plus alpha square. I'm interested in alpha plus ten for some reason. Okay, so let's see how do we find alpha plus ten real quick? We simply take alpha plus five and square it. Okay, so that will be alpha square plus alpha plus four. But what is alpha plus four? Alpha plus one, so it's going to be alpha square plus alpha plus one. Okay, so these are quick computations. Okay, all right. So, so if you now try and compute the minimal polynomial of alpha plus five. Okay, so I want to try and compute the minimal polynomial of alpha plus five. Okay, so it turns out. So I'm going to give you the uh, answer directly. I mean, it's, it's not too easy to difficult to see. So you see, alpha plus ten. Has only alpha square, alpha and one, and then alpha plus five has alpha plus alpha square. And then you can see x square plus x plus one will be the will be a minimal polynomial for alpha plus five. Okay, I know this result from some other way, but anyway, so just take it from me. This will be the minimal polynomial for alpha plus five. You can quickly check it. It's an irreducible polynomial. You put in alpha plus five, what happens? So alpha plus ten plus alpha plus five plus one, which is zero. Okay, so clearly this is a valid answer. I mean, it's not a wrong answer. So that's the minimal polynomial. Okay. So now, if I construct a field with this minimal polynomial, what field will I get? If I use it to construct a field, what field will I get? My construction x squared plus x plus one. If I use it as a pi of x, I get a four. Right? So that's it. So I get a four if I construct it. So I use this as pi of x. I'm going to get a four, which may be I'll denote as Gamma one plus gamma, which is the same as gamma squared, and then gamma plus three is one. Okay, right? So, so what this means is there is an isomorphic copy of F four sitting inside my F sixteen, and what is that isomorphic copy? Okay, so from here we can go into this, and that will be zero one alpha plus five and alpha plus ten. Okay, so this guy is actually isomorphic to 
f4 okay you can quickly check that i mean anything you do with 0 1 alpha plus alpha, alpha plus n you will never leave that set that's the first thing you have to check to see that it's a valid subfield right you will never leave that set you multiply it with each other square or add whatever you do will be inside the set okay that is the first thing you can check and you can also check that it's a field I and mean, it's not very hard okay and it's isomorphic to a field all right so this is what uh, this is what i mean by mean by this thing of going to from an element to its minimal polynomial and constructing the field with that minimal polynomial as the irreducible polynomial and that gives you an isomorphic copy of whatever you construct inside okay so this is an abstract idea which is used in a lot of abstract results which frankly are not really needed in error control coding but i guess it's, it's a, it might be of interest to you it's good to know anyway okay so that's the that's the point all right any questions or clarifications are okay all right so 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 one place where i used this idea was to show that uh, if 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 uh, the property that we are interested in of uh, beta belonging to f p r m is primitive then what happens that implies degree of m beta by x equals m okay so there's also another way to show this which is doesn't mean we call the isomorphism and all that which is probably much quicker any ideas did anyone think about it is there any other way to show it which doesn't require isomorphism all this fancy stuff no yes maybe hmm yeah but you are using the isomorphism again i don't want any home so you can use the fact that beta and beta part p have the same minimal polynomial okay so what should happen the minimal polynomial of beta should have beta as its root should have beta part p as its root beta part p square as its root so on till it can never repeat because beta is primitive it can never repeat earlier than p par m minus 1 so it will have m different roots in f p par so that is a quick way of saying that this m beta should should have degree equal to m in fact that's, that's another tool you can use okay which is which maybe skips that but i wanted to do the isomorphism first because this, i'm going to prove one more result for which you definitely need the isomorphism okay so that's why that's why we do that all right so primitive you have degree of m beta of x being equal to m okay and there are much stronger results which are true in fact you can show any minimal polynomial has to have degree that divides m okay not just less than or equal to m it should divide m okay we'll prove that but before that we'll see a quick result about isomorphism of fields okay so this is a very important result let me write it down uh two fields with uh, any two fields with p par m elements are isomorphic okay so remember so far the only thing which has been a sticking point for us in the whole area is we have never shown that for every m and every p there is a field with p par m and so never shown that explicitly whenever we have an irreducible polynomial of degree m over set p we know there is a there is a field of p par f that's that's a point we will come to it soon enough but but let's say somebody comes up with two different fields both of size p par m both of number of elements p par m and then both of them have to be isomorphic to each other okay so that is something that we can show okay and that goes through this x par p par m minus 1 and this uh, p par m minus x factorization and the isomorphism that i did just now okay so let me try and do that not too hard okay so i could call these things as theorems if you like but i'm just avoiding the word just a fact just to keep you a little bit more happy okay so theorem some sudden suddenly sounds like a bit more scary than fact okay all right so two fields just definitely have a status of a theorem so it's a fairly big statement it's not a very small statement So two fields with p par m elements are isomorphic to each other. Okay, so let's say f and g are two fields with uh, p par m elements. Okay, so of course. Okay, so the crucial notion is x par p par m minus x will factor into fac uh, linear factors over both all the elements of f. and all the elements of g that is also true but nevertheless the factors of x par p par m minus x over z p x they will be unique they will be the same so if you put together you should get the same factorization okay so that's a strong limitation you cannot really have 
too many different things and that is the crux of this proof ok so let's let's try and prove it ok so so let's say uh, let's let's start with the uh, let's start with the field f uh, let's say beta is primitive in f ok so this is a primitive element let's say that's beta ok now look at m beta of x ok this is an irreducible factor of irreducible degree m factor of factor of what x bar t bar m minus x we know that and that's it's it's over z p x right m beta of x is over z p x right ok so what that means is there will be an element of g for which the same m beta of x is a minimal polynomial. So it has to happen well, x beta x p power m minus x factors into the same factors over z p x and it factors into linear factors in over g so there should be some elements which combine together and give you the same m beta of x in in that factorization ok so clearly there should be an element of g for which m beta of x is a minimal polynomial. ok so that is the link once you have that everything is done ok so this implies so all that I said just now which probably I didn't uh, uh, I am not going to write that write down those things very precisely. So I will say x p power m minus x equals product of elements of g x minus gamma ok and m beta of x divides this thing, right which equals this. So that implies there exists uh, let us say some gamma prime in G such that such that what m gamma prime of x equals m beta of x. Ok, right. So, what can possibly be the next step? Yeah, so you take this m gamma prime of x and then create a field with that as your irreducible polynomial. Ok, that is clearly in inside g and it is equal to all of g now that is also isomorphic to to f ok or let us say homomorphic to f but then the sizes are the same so it has to be isomorphic ok so it is also isomorphic to f so through that field which we constructed f and g have to be isomorphic ok so that is the idea so you construct a field with power of x equal to m gamma prime of x equal to m beta of x. This guy on the one side is isomorphic to s on the other side is isomorphic to g. So, from there s and g are s. Ok, so that is the idea. So, it is kind of a slightly abstract idea but you see the central idea, central link that connects these two things is this x bar p power m minus x and how it has to factor into linear factors over any field with p power m elements. Ok, so once you have that everything gets tied on the minimal polynomials come from it, everything comes from it, okay, the unique factorization, all those things is all you know, play into this but essentially these two are ok. So, what is so nice about it is once you have a degree m irreducible polynomial over z p x, the field, the field with p power m elements is known to you, ok, there cannot be any other field, somebody says there is some other field anything he can do he or she can do with that field you can also do with this field that you have because both of them are isomorphic there is nothing new that will come out of any field that is unknown ok so any two fields with p power m elements are the same alright so that is the that is the one result that comes out of this so the last thing we have to show is the existence of uh, a field with p power m elements Ok, so that is the next thing we are going to show and I am going to show it in a rather quick way skipping through most of the steps ok, I will do only maybe one proof very clearly and then after that the next part I will skip through real quick. Is there a question? What is the question? Yeah, yesterday I spoke in my last class I spoke briefly about it 
it has to be true, right? Every irreducible polynomial, which is a factor of x bar p par m minus x. Okay. For that, there has to be an element of every field for which it will be a minimal polynomial. Because that's quite simple. I mentioned it very briefly in the beginning of last class. It has to be true. Okay. In fact, it's also true that for every irreducible polynomial, there will be some element. Because the easiest thing is to just construct a field with that irreducible polynomial as pi of x. Right? And for that alpha that you used, this has to be the irreducible polynomial. Right? So, for every irreducible polynomial, there is a field element with that polynomial as its minimal polynomial also. But also is true. So all these things are true. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's, that's obvious from that, right? So, you can do it that way. So, you take, so for instance, the point he's making is if you have an irreducible polynomial of degree m, it has to divide x bar p par m minus x. How do you show that? So, you start with that irreducible polynomial, construct the field with p par m elements. Okay? You know that that irreducible polynomial is the minimal polynomial of the element alpha that you assume for that, right? In the construction, you, you take an alpha, and that is the root of and beta of x, uh, this irreducible polynomial, and that is has to be the minimal polynomial, and that will have to divide x bar p per m. So all these results are nicely true because of that. Okay, so, we, so I'm going to formally kind of state a couple of make a couple of make a statement which will kind of include what you're saying also. Okay, so this next fact is, is also quite big. That's the status of the theorem, but anyway, so I'll just put it down as a fact. X bar p bar m minus x equals the product of all monic irreducible polynomials of degree b such that Okay, over I should say, okay, over the Px of degree such that d divides. Okay, so this kind of covers what you are you are trying to say also. There are various ways. I mean, what you said will be one of the proofs, one of the part, the part of a proof of this case. Okay, so x bar p bar m minus x is the product of all monic irreducible polynomials of degree d that divides x. Okay, so if you take for instance p equals 2, so let's just take a couple of examples to illustrate what this means. So if you usually we take p equals 2, so if you take p equals 2 and p equals 4, okay, what it means is x bar 16 minus x is the product of all monic irreducible binary polynomials of degree 1, 2 and 4. Okay, what, what are the polynomials of degree, so I can do plus here because p is 2, what are the uh, degree 1 irreducible polynomials x and x plus 1. What are the degree 2 irreducible polynomials? What are the only degree 2 irreducible polynomials? Okay, and then degree 4, it turns out there are three of them x bar 4 plus x plus 1, x bar 4 plus x bar 2 plus 1, and x bar 4 plus x bar 3 plus x bar plus x plus 1. Okay? So that's the idea. Okay, so we are going to need a lot of elements in this proof. I may not be able to go through all the things and like I said, it's, it's not too crucial that you know this, you know the proof of this result. No, more important is to know the statement precisely. Okay, so if you want one more example, you can do p equals 2 when equals 3. So that would mean x bar 8 plus x, basically x times x plus 1 times Three plus one. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, statement that this is made. So it's, it's nice to know that. Okay. So, so another important place where such a result is used, you might wonder why this result is used, is to figure out if you have a big field, what are the small fields that are contained inside? Okay. So. So as now I showed you some results where I said you have a big field, you take an element, find its minimal polynomial, and then construct the field with that minimal polynomial. That field is contained inside this bigger field. Okay. So now how do I find out what fields are contained inside this bigger field? I go through and look at all d that divides m, and every f p par d has to be now inside f p par m. Whenever d divides. M. So that's one of the kind of corollaries of the statement if you think about it. Okay. So because you have a minimal polynomial of degree d, right? 
and that's that's going to come up somewhere in the in the factorization. Okay, and so that, that's how you do this. So, so anyway, we'll come to that later. So all these things are uh, nice to know. So if you have a very large field, you're naturally interested in figuring out what are the small fields that are contained in it, and this gives you clues as to what can happen. Okay, so let's try to prove it. Um, so, so maybe I should just skip the proof. You know, the proof will repeatedly use this idea of the isomorphism. You know, so you go to an element beta in a field for m, look at its minimal polynomial, and etc. Et et okay. So it's, it's I don't know if it's uh, it's needed to uh, show this. So let me let me see if I can. Okay. So let me show maybe a couple of quick facts. You know, at least a couple of steps, and then we'll see. Okay. So. So, so, so there are two things to be proved here. Okay, first thing is, uh, if there is an irreducible polynomial of degree d such that d divides m, you have to show that that irreducible polynomial divides x bar p bar m minus x. That's one thing we have to show. And then there's also another thing we have to show. If there is an irreducible factor, a polynomial which is a factor of x bar p bar m minus one, then you have to show d divides. M. So if I show those two, then the statement is true. Right? Did you have a question? Yes. Yes, you can. No, it won't have 12. See, actually, in fact, one of them will not, its root will not be a primitive. We will come to that. See, I said the primitive element has degree m minimal polynomial. The opposite is not true. Degree m minimal polynomial does not mean the element is primitive. Primitive comes from some other definition. Okay, so we will see that also. Okay, so so let's try to prove at least one part of it. Okay, yes. The pre uh, polynomial will have at least one primitive. The pre-degree m polynomial will have. Oh no 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 no. So either all the roots are primitive or no root is primitive. That will be the result. For every irreducible polynomial, either all the roots will be primitive or none of them will be primitive. In fact, the, all of them will have the same order. It's, it's easy to show that. We will come to it. <laughs> so let me just quickly get rid of this. Yes. 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 At least m. Most cases it will be more than m. Okay. All right. So let us uh, move on and finish this proof if there are no more questions. Okay. So the first thing is uh, let us say let us say some polynomial, let us say pi of x is irreducible degree d such that d divides m. Okay. So, if you take d equals 1, the statement is, is quite trivial. In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's pi of x is x or x plus 1, x minus 1, then it is it's very. So, let us say, okay, let me not let me not say that. If, if pi of x is equal to x, this uh, is done, right. Okay, if power of x is equal to x, then what happens? X clearly divides x bar p bar m minus x. There's nothing much to do. Okay, so this is uh, this is a done deal. It's no big deal. So usually the only tricky thing is to x divides x bar p bar m minus x, and we are done. So we can assume power of x is not equal to. X. Okay, so if we do that. Uh, pi of x says uh, degree d. So, so one thing we know is, uh, so, so by uh, Vignesh should asking this question. So, if pi of x is irreducible and has degree d, pi of x divides what? You know, pi of x divides. See, pi of x. So, one one thing to remember. So, so pi of x is not x, and it has degree d. So, pi of x divides x times x bar p bar d. Uh, minus 1 minus 1, am I right? Which implies pi of x is not x, so which implies pi of x divides x bar p bar d minus 1, right? This has to happen. Okay, so how do we show this step? How do we show this step? Yeah, so you take pi of x as the irreducible polynomial with which you are constructing a finite field. You know that 
that pi of x itself will be a reducible polynomial, will be a valid minimal polynomial for that, and that has to divide the x bar p bar d minus 1. You know it is not x, so it has to divide x bar p bar d minus 1 minus 1. Okay. So now, uh, okay, so now, now I have to show, now I have to show that when d divides m, x bar p bar d minus 1 minus 1 will divide x bar p bar m minus 1. That, that can be shown. Okay, so we can show this I will skip. It is not very hard. I will tell you the steps. It is not very hard. x bar p bar d minus 1 minus 1 divides x bar p bar m minus 1 minus 1. So the crucial thing here is uh, whenever d divides m. Okay, the crucial step to show here is that in fact p power d minus 1 divides p power m minus 1 whenever this is and only if d divides m. Okay, so this is the step which you can show. Okay, it is not very hard. Okay, so if d divides m it is very easy to show that it divides. You can also show the if and only if. If d does not divide m, p power d minus 1 will not divide p power m minus 1. Okay, so, so think about how you might want to show it. You have to divide m by d, then use that quotient and reminder to write this as it is it's, it's some, it requires a minor algebraic modification or manipulation that this can be shown. So once you show this, whenever d divides m, what happens? This guy divides that guy and that is enough to show that this polynomial will also divide that polynomial. Okay? So if you have like x bar a minus 1, then with x bar b minus 1, you have to show that if a divides b, then clearly this polynomial will also divide that. Okay? So you can easily show that it is not very hard to Alright, so that is the idea. So that proves in one direction that if you have pi of x being an irreducible polynomial of degree d and d divides m, then pi of x will divide the x bar p bar m minus x. Okay, so the opposite direction is also in a very similar way. So let me see. If you have, if pi of x divides x bar p bar m minus x, then we have to show D divides m. Okay, so that's what we will do, right? All right. So here, what you do is the following. Okay, so it's not very hard. So first assumption you get rid of is that pi of x equals x. If pi of x equals x, you can get rid of. So once you get rid of that, so pi of x is not equal to x, which means pi of x divides x bar p bar m minus one minus one. Okay, so you get rid of. Uh, so 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 we assume pi of x is not equal to x. Equal to x is quite easy. Then that implies pi of x divides x bar p power m minus 1 minus 1. Okay? So if you do this, then what will happen is you can show that p power d minus 1 will divide p power m minus 1. Okay? So if you have pi of x degree equals d, okay? then from here you can show that this implies p power d minus 1 will have to divide, I am sorry, uh, no, 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 p power d minus 1, right? sorry. Will have to divide p power m minus 1. The reason is, you can show that there has to be an element of this field which has order p power d minus 1. You can show that. Okay. In fact, you take uh, this pi of x with pi of x you construct a field. Okay. It will have p power d elements. So, there will be an element in that field whose order is exactly equal to p power d minus 1. Okay. And that field will be inside a field of f p power m because pi of x divides x power p power m minus x. So, this f, power, f p power m has an element of order p power d minus 1. Okay, that can happen only if p power d minus 1 divides p power m minus 1. Okay, that also we know, right? That has to So once, once from here you can go to d divides m. Because we know that result already. So p power d minus 1 divides p power m minus 1 if and only if d divides m. Okay, so you use this result and you get that. In fact, this result is true for any n. Okay, so and I do not even need pre prime here. Okay, so for any number n, if you have n power d minus 1, it divides n power m minus 1 if and only if d divides n. Okay, so that is true. So once you have such results, you can prove this. Okay, so in, for this step, you need to show that there exists uh, some alpha n f p power m such that order of alpha equals p power d minus 1. How do you show that? You start with pi of x and construct a field. Okay, it has an element of order p power d minus 1. But you know that that field is isomorphic to a subfield of f p power m precisely because that is true. Okay, so, so that is true. Oh my goodness, what happened? 
So that is an element of order p by d minus 1. That means p by d minus 1 divides p by m minus 1, and that means d divides it. Okay? So that is the proof for this result. I know it went a little bit quick, but uh, the, like I said, the main thing is to remember that this is true. Okay? So from here, you can show using this result an interesting property. Okay? So first of all, equate the degrees on both sides. Okay? What happens when you equate the degree on both sides? On the left hand side, you have p par m. On the right hand side, you will have what? You will have an expression like this. Okay? Suppose you write down, so n of m is the number of irreducible monic, of course, okay, so monic irreducible polynomials of degree m. Okay? Was at P. Okay. What is the degree of the right hand side there? On the left hand side you have P par M. On the right hand side you will have summation over D dividing M. What? D times M of P. Right? For every D that divides M, you have N of D such polynomials. If you multiply them out together, we are going to get the d times n of d, add it all up, p par n has to be equal to this. Okay? So such such equations are, I don't know if you have taken a course in number theory, you will see that such equations are have enormous potential for exploitation. Okay? You can show some very interesting properties with such equations. Okay? So this, so the formula involving d dividing m, there is a very standard uh, way to invert it. Okay? You can invert this, it is called Mobius inversion. You can use some properties of uh, very interesting results in number theory. This is quite standard in uh, reasonable number theory. So you can use something to invert it. Okay? So you will get a formula for n of m which is reasonably explicit. Okay? And then you bound the formula and you can show n of m is strictly greater than 1. Greater than or equal to 1. Strictly greater than 0. Okay? So from here you can show, I am skipping it, but you can show using the inversion that is called Mobius inversion. Okay? So you use Mobius inversion and get a formula for I don't have time to go into the details here. I can give you references if you like. You can show n of m is greater than or equal to. Okay. So what does that mean? So there was a result that I was after from day one, right? That there exists at least one monic irreducible polynomial for every m and every. Okay. So this is how you can go through and prove that. Okay. So it's also another way to show the existence of f p par m directly. Okay. I'm skipping that. But, uh, but this is a nice proof. You already know, also know that there is there is an irreducible polynomial for every m and every. Okay, so this step is a bit more uh, involved number theory. You don't need to go there. So once you do that, you can show it. All right. So I think this kind of slowly is bringing us to an end of what I wanted to do in finite fields, except for this last and most important property of minimal polynomials. Okay, so this is a this is probably the most important property. That okay, I don't know, I don't remember the number, it's really good. Okay. This is the most critical one and this is what is most useful in coding theory. Okay. So final property that we are going to see is most useful for communications and error control coding. Okay. So this is the this is the place where you pay real attention. Okay. So so if you have D by N S P R M, so it takes it's going to take some time to develop this property, I want to do it carefully. Okay. First we'll define conjugates of people. This key conjugates of beta are from this set beta, beta square p, beta power p square, so on. Okay. So there, this will this cannot be an infinite set, okay. So it will repeat somewhere. Okay. It might repeat somewhere depending on beta. Okay. So we can't say where it will repeat very easily, I and mean, there's a way to precisely say how it will repeat. But anyway, so for the arbitrary beta and FP param, it will eventually repeat. So this will be a finite set. Okay. Don't think of this as an infinite set or something. So this is a finite set. That is the first thing. One thing we know already is the minimal polynomial of beta will have all the elements of this set as roots. Okay, the conjugates of beta will be roots of the minimal polynomial. Okay, so this will be the conjugates of beta will be distinct roots of m beta x. Okay, so let's say this this thing kind of ends at uh, let's say b let, let's say beta is such that beta power 
okay, so let me be careful here. So I have to figure out where it ends. No, I mean, so let's say this. Uh, we'll have a notation for it. I'll call the C B part. Okay. Uh, let us say we assume size of C B part equals some D. Okay, so let let this be some D. So it has D elements. Okay. So this will be distinct roots of M beta of X. Okay, so one thing we can show we can be sure is if you look at this polynomial, product of alpha is in alpha n C beta X minus alpha. Okay, what can I say about this polynomial? This will have to divide M beta of X. Okay. But in fact, it turns out this is equal to M beta. Okay, we can show this. Let's see. Let's see if it goes through. This proof is a bit, a bit dicey. Okay. So let's look at this polynomial f of x, called f of x, which is product of okay. So how does this look? This goes to look x minus theta times x minus theta bar p times x minus theta bar p squared. So until till where will it go? Theta r d, you are d minus one. Go all the way to d. Okay. So x minus theta r. Theta, I think it's d minus one. Okay. So one is basically theta r zero. Okay. So it goes all the way from zero. So that's how it will go. Okay. Uh, let's say we multiply this out, and we'll get certain coefficients, right? So that's going to be x zero plus. F one x all the way to F d x power d. Okay, so there are a lot d terms. Okay, so let's say we multiply it out and we get these coefficients. So we need to show we need to show what a phi belongs to z p. Okay, if we do that, then we are done. Okay. So how do we show that? So for that, we we'll use a few uh, few results. Okay. So So there are so 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 the so, so first thing I'm going to show is f i par p equals f i. Okay, so that's what we will show. Okay, so this is equivalent to showing f i power p equals f i. Okay. So so you might wonder why this is true. But see, for elements of z p, clearly f i par p will be equal to f i. Okay, that's okay. But it also turns out in a larger field, if you have any element which satisfies This equation, it also belongs to z. Okay, that is also true. Okay, it's, it's not too hard to uh, try to prove this. It's, it's something you can try and prove. Okay, so that's that's another fact. So let me write down: if f p par m is for exists uh, alpha such that alpha par p par d equals alpha, then alpha belongs to S P bar D, which is contained in. Okay, so this can only happen if D divides M. Okay, right? This cannot happen if D doesn't divide M, which is contained in S P bar. All right. So that is also true. So we're going to exploit this fact, which is quite easy to show. Then we will just show this case. Okay, so S P bar P equals S bar P. Okay. So the first step in that is to raise this equation we have on both sides 
to the power of t. Okay. If you do that, all right. If you do that, you have to look at even case, odd case carefully, but you will see that the right hand side expression does not change. The reason is you raise it to the power p, what will happen? You will get here x power p minus beta power p. Okay, so assuming b p is odd for instance, just for starting. Here you will get x power p minus beta power p. Here you will get x power p minus beta power c squared. This will become the next term, so on. What will be the last term? x power p minus beta power p power d, but that has to be equal to p beta. Okay, only then you will have exactly d elements in your conjugate list. Okay, so that will become like the first element, except that instead of x you have x power p. Okay, so what happens if you come this side and raise the left hand side to the power p? If you raise this guy to the power p, what happens? Again, it will become f0 power p plus f1 power p, x power p plus f2 power p, x power p. Now, this, this is like an identity in x power p. You simply replace x power p to y and equate coefficients on both sides, you should get s i power p equals f1. Okay, so that is the idea. So, how do you prove this? You raise both sides to power p. Okay. So, you might wonder what if p is even. The only even is 2 and for even for 2 it does not matter whether it is minus or plus everything is the same. So, it works out the same. Alright. So, that is the way you prove this result. Okay. You can show that f i power p equals f i and that, that gets you the result. Okay. So, this is quite crucial for coding theory. You will see that later. So, this is probably the most important result that you have to map up and remember about minimal polynomials. Okay. How do you find minimal polynomial of element? Find all its conjugate first, take, take the linear terms x minus conjugate, multiply them out, you will get the minimum polynomial. Okay. It is important. Okay. So, so, so let me conclude uh, this with one final uh, uh, couple of minutes. I am going to take 10 more minutes on Thursdays, right? So, hopefully it is okay. So do not mind that. We will stop at 2. Five more minutes left. Okay. So, so let's let's quickly see one one uh, subfield property. I'll just write it down real quick, and then we'll go on to examples of many polynomials. Okay. So, the statement that I wrote down here, I'm going to write it down like a result. Uh, f p par d is contained in f p par m, if and only if d divides m. Okay. So, this is a result which we kind of proved in the previous statements. I'm not going to write down a special proof for it again. But this is true. Okay, so f p par d is contained in f p par m, and this statement also. Okay, remember this is also important. Okay, if if any element satisfies alpha par p par d equals alpha, then it belongs to the subfield also. Okay, so these are this is a fairly important statement. So if you take for instance f two power uh, some large number, let's say f two power let's say twelve, okay, just for fun, and if you want to go from f two to f z. You can think of various directions, you know. So you have uh, F4 and uh, then what? F uh, so this F4 is what? F2 squared, right? And then you have F2 power 3. Okay, you can think of like some kind of hierarchy here. And then you have uh, f2 power 6 okay and then you also have f2 power 4 so I am putting arrows to indicate the containment okay, so this is the kind of picture that you can draw to show how this uh, containment usually works okay so even though there are these so many of these finite fields they are all kind of contained within each other okay so, so it is not really a uh, it's, it's, it's totally interconnected. It's not that each of these fields is all distinct and they are not connected to each, to each other. Because of this uh, subfield result, this whole number of finite fields, they are all kind of connected to each other. And all these minimal polynomials will keep showing up. Okay? So, if you factor x part 2 part 12 plus x, you will get all the minimal polynomials that can ever be there everywhere. Okay? So, they are all connected in some way and they will keep occurring again and again and again in different forms. Okay? In an isomorphic sense, they are all the same. Okay, so that's one point I wanted to make. The another point I wanted to make is 
the following, okay, so we will never use it in this course, but it's important if you're doing this for some other reason. So, so I've been talking about Zp and then extending Zp to Fp par m through a polynomial power of x irreducible degree m over Zp, right? This is what we've been talking about and this is our construction, right? And this is a unique construction as in there's no other field of size p par m, we know all that. Okay, so this is what we've been talking about. So there is an extension possible where instead of zp, you consider some other f p par something. Okay, so for instance, what I can do is I can start with some q which is itself, say some p power s. Okay, and then look at f q. Alright. Then okay, so so then you take f q and you can extend f q to f q par m. Okay. How do you do it? You do it in the exact same way, except that you need a power of x which is irreducible over f q x and degree m. Okay? So you can think of like a chain of fields. You can start with f p, then use, uh, let's say this is pi 1 x, use pi 0 x, which is irreducible over of px degree s and then you can extend it further in the exact same method that we used okay the a0 plus a1 except that the ai will come from fq and you will have a degree m and you will do everything modulo pi 1 x so you can do this double extension okay in fact it will also be true that there is a degree sorry there exists a degree ms Pi of x in irreducible power of x in Fpx, which will give you the direct extension also. It is also possible. In fact, that field is unique, right? This is two different ways of constructing that same field. Okay, you can do this. And every statement I made with P can be replaced with Q, which is a power of prime. For instance, this statement. This statement. There is a statement. This statement, you can replace P with Q, where Q is a power of prime. So Q equals P power X. You can replace it. So you will get, even this statement can be replaced that way. This statement also can be replaced that way. Instead of P, you can have a power of prime, which means N of M is greater than or equal to 1 for every Q, not necessarily P. For every power of prime also, you have an irreducible polynomial of degree M for every M and every Q. Okay. So all these things are possible. Okay, so for every m, every m and every q, you have an irreducible polynomial. That is also true. All the factoring is true. Okay, the, all the conjugates. Instead of raising it to the power p, you will be raising it to the power q when you do the conjugates. All those things you can do in these higher fields also. Okay, but we'll hardly ever use it. Okay, for us, the most interesting case in coding is to pick p equals two, and then m m equals two, three, four, etc. Okay. So this is the most interesting case in coding, okay? but in general the fields exist always. Okay, all right. So I'm going to stop here for today. Next week, next week we'll uh, start doing some tutorials. Okay, so I think when is the quiz? What day? Tuesday of next week. Huh? Oh, then we'll have uh, class on Monday next week. Oh, no, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then another Monday, right? So, okay, so Monday I will do some things and then from Tuesday onwards we will start looking at problems. Uh, as uh, all of you have access to the problem set, right? You know where the problem set is. You go to my web page, you navigate towards the course, you will get two assignments. One will be on linear block codes, another assignment will be on finite fields, etc. So, both those assignments are included. There are also solutions, I believe, for some of them. Okay. 